Okay, now we're going to start over. Um, when you go to the pages that are talking about the crafts, you will be able to see each of the uh, YouTubes in full screen, just like usual. And for some reason, the way that I've saved them all on a Word document is not allowing us to see them full screen right here. But there are a couple of amazing things that I want to show you. So I'd like you to particularly note that you should definitely look at the making of the masks for Lion King. You should look at War Horse, which was a gigantic puppet um, operated by three people. Okay, and you see the three human beings, they're integral to the working of the puppet. There's an incredible TED talk about the War Horse, making of War Horse and how they did that. And then also some scenic YouTube so that you can see some of the different elements of scenic. Then I just go to the lecture portion and we'll take a look at that quickly so that you know here are all the different kinds of jobs and what they do backstage and then the, the videos will demonstrate what people do. So I think that might be the easiest way to go about it, okay? So the crafts of uh, Let me get to the full presentation mode. No, how do I see this? Oh, you guys, I'm just like a, such a terrible technical person. Okay. There we go. So we're going to talk about, the, when we talk about the crafts and theater, we are talking about the people who are responsible for taking the design from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. And craft is not a derogatory term. Some people think it is like you're a crafter, you're working with uh, fun felt little squares and you're creating things um, that are very, uh, you know, just usual and boring and that it's not creative. To be able to interpret the design into three-dimensional so that either a three-dimensional human being can work with it or can sit on it or can lean on it or can hold it in their hand is an incredibly creative part of the process. And it's when you discover, a, you know, what is that thing that is really exciting to you? Is it the creating of, of the design? Is it the imagining of what that character looks like? Or it is then taking and working with the designer to have that vision become a reality. So we'll take a look at these based on each of the different crafts. So if we talk, we briefly talked about these last time. And if we talk about the uh, tech director, the tech director is the one that is responsible for taking the drawings of the designer, turning them uh, front to back, and then draws everything about how this particular item will be built. So whether it's a staircase, whether it's a couch, or whether it's a wall, the technical director's expertise is in translating that image from the designer into a three-dimensional object that can actually be built and they work in the scene shop. The shop foreman is the one who executes and prioritizes the work for the shop. So if the technical director is responsible for creating all of the different um, elements uh, and the drawings of it, the shop foreman has to interpret those into how we're actually going to make them. So it, all of the materials come, generally they're ordered and they're delivered to the scene dock and they come in very specific sizes. You know, for example, if you're working with wood, you're working with two by four, one by three, four by eight. These are all measurements that are predetermined that you can go down to Home Depot and buy them. And generally, the tech director is the one responsible for breaking up all of the design elements and putting them into these stock formulas so that they can be built out of these kinds of materials. And there's a discussion usually between the tech director and the designer. Do you want this, do you want this built out of wood? Do you want this built out of metal? Do you want this built out of, um, out of uh, different kinds of three-dimensional product? How do you see that happening? And then the tech director will implement that. The shop foreman then interprets those drawings and starts working by actually uh, assigning people in the shop, the master carpenter. Here, we're going to cut up this piece of wood. You're working on this particular project. The stairs, 
you're going to cut this, it's going to be, is it going to be screwed together? Is it going to be nailed together? Is it going to be glued and then screwed? And then um, sometimes that person goes through and becomes a finished carpenter so that all the rough edges are removed. This is as in costume, we are constantly uh, discussing this particular portion of, you know, well, this, this, um, this railing has a burr on it. It's catching the costumes. We need to have the finished carpenter come in. It is, uh, they're responsible for sanding it. They're responsible for putting whatever um, surface treatment as dictated by the painted elevations from the set designer. And generally it's, it starts with a base coat of paint that anybody can do. There's just assistance in the shop. And then the scenic artist can take it over if there's going to be a three dimensionality to that piece of wood. If it's a flat piece and you're gonna paint it three dimensionally, if it's um, even if it's a three dimensional railing and banister, the flat paint goes on and the scenic artist can come in and then do the top layers of paint on top of it. A scenic artist needs to be facile in both painting a faux finish, whether that is um, painting wood grain on a floor, whether it's painting marble on a column, or whether it's painting a backdrop with a complete garden on it so that when that backdrop is there, you feel as though you're outside. This is a separate category in the union, the IATSC union that's mentioned in your book, um, the International Alliance of Theatrical and Stage Employees is the scenic artist is actually in the Designers Guild, uh, which is USA United Scenic Artists 829. So the category of scenic artist is there along with set designer, costume designer, lighting designer, sound designer, and projection design, because it is recognized as one of the, as one of the specific arts that is required. The set designer may determine exactly what should happen, but they're writing, they're, they are painting it a scale elevation in maybe one half inch equals one foot. And it's the scenic artist's responsibility to to scale that up to the size that's needed to fill up the entire stage. So each of these people has to work together to create this um, idea that the set designer has designed. Along with that, properties can be major pieces of furniture that are procured or found by some, any kind of method uh, or they are fabricated and made. And then sometimes you have a property designer who is responsible for doing those drawings. Sometimes that comes under the tech director's purview. If you need to make, for example, a very special wagon when you're doing Music Man, when it says the Wells Fargo wagons are coming into town and you're going to actually see that and the set designer said, yes, we're going to see that. The director says, yes, we're going to have somebody ride in on that wagon. What does that wagon look like? The set designer does a drawing of that, does an ele painted elevation of what that should look like. The technical director then takes that and makes that into a three-dimensional, uh, probably wood with other kinds of wooden spoke wheels to be manufactured. And then the property department can manufacture that specific thing, knows that it needs to be weight bearing, it gets painted, and then it will be actually put into the show and to be pulled by either a human, a horse, or whatever. I mean, I have seen, I've actually worked when we've had horses on stage. So, you know, what is, the property can be anything. The first thing that, one of the very first things that I worked on was a show called Wild Duck. And I was in charge of really, the, I worked with the set designer directly. And there was a tech director that created the, drawings for the walls, but everything else became under this, this idea of prop procurement. And I realized that actually I was acting more as an art director in the way that a film does. I went from place to place to place. I asked for um, free products I, uh, to be put on stage and they would be given program credit. And at that time, they, people, you know, small shops are still interested in doing that. So for this particular piece. Um, I was able to get a bearskin rug. I was able to get a wooden, um, 
a wood stove, wood burning stove, I got, of course, the wild duck stuffed. I, I got things that were paintings that were put on the wall. I got certain kinds of furniture. I got all kinds of things to fill up that, that um, stage. So that's, that comes under procurement. How are you going to get those things to your location? And then how are you going to use them? How do you get permission for that? And how do you get insurance so that when they go back to the shop, they are still in the best possible um, condition so that they can still be sold? And again, remember that we're using things that are that are either antique or things that are already pre-owned. So there is some wear and tear that already happened. But much like the birds, sorry, just a moment. Philippe? I need you to be a little quieter, okay? Uh, much like when I said we did the, the pet shop and the birds could not be rented, um, there are some things that cannot be rented or borrowed because of in case of damage, and then you decide in your budget if you have enough money to purchase those, or do they need to be made from scratch because they will be taking such a beating on stage. This translates into a production run crew. What do you need to then run the show? All of these things are pre-show, and when you get to dress rehearsal, hopefully those jobs are completely done, and then you turn this over to the production run crew. Those are the people that will be coming before each production. They'll be mopping the deck, making sure that the stage is completely clean and without hazard for the actors. All the scenery will be preset into act one. The properties will be checked in. There will be a prop table backstage where each item has a specific location. It's usually a table with a piece of paper on top, a big butcher piece that, so that if they need a cane, if they need an umbrella, if they need a briefcase, if they need a cigarette lighter, an ashtray that is carried in, those each are outlined on this butcher paper with a label so that the prop is returned to that every time. And the prop, the prop manager who's running the show will check in their props so that every single scene and every single prop is there. The actor is also responsible for checking that their own props are preset and in place for them. And in, in the end, it comes down to the actors, the one that will be embarrassed on stage if they don't have their prop. That's why the prop department sets it. The actor checks the setting of the prop. Scenery shifts are things that happen in between scenes. So if you're doing a big show and you have act one in the living room and act two in the bedroom, there will be a, a big physical shift of a stage. And if you're working in a very small space, where you are just moving a chair in and out. Sometimes that happens with the actors or it happens with, with crew. Sometimes the crew is, as we say, in kabuki black so that we are not to see them. Sometimes they're dressed in the same period as the show so that the um, audience thinks that they are part of the scene that they're supposed to be seeing. Okay. Uh, so if you have questions on scenic, you can mention those. And we'll go to stage management. The production stage manager is the one that has been with the director since the very beginning. They've gone through all of the rehearsals and then go through technical rehearsals. The stage manager will be writing down all of the cues into a prompt book the production stage manager really runs the show after it goes into dress rehearsal and through performance. The designers and the director are no longer there. It is the stage manager's job to make sure that the show maintains the same consistency from opening night to closing night. If there are any line readings, a, the, other, the stage manager or an assistant stage manager will note that the actor has not said the line correctly. Those go into the rehearsal report and will say, you know, Bob missed line, blah, blah. And then there will be a line reading rehearsal for the actors so that they are able to manage the lines consistently as placed by the director. And then the crew is the one that will um, make sure that the actor is called. There will be uh, notifications given by 
as directed by the stage manager. There's a call time for the actors. According to equity, actors need not show up any earlier than 30 minutes before curtain, so they have to be able to be prepared to go on stage because the house opens at 30 minutes before curtain. If you're checking your props and you need to go out on stage, you need to arrive before that time. The crew is the one that's responsible for making sure that the actors uh, get their 30 minutes to places, 15 minutes to places, five minutes to places call, meaning you have five minutes before you're expected to be called to go on stage, and then you're called to stage, which means you'll be standing backstage ready for your entrance. Let me see if this is a little chat up here. Okay. And uh, so they, the production stage manager truly runs the show. Okay, I've lost my cursor. Here we go. <laughs> In the costume department, it is, um, there are far more variables. First of all, we're not working with empty space. We're working with a three-dimensional human body. Each human body has its own set of criteria that um, we call measurements. So the costume shop manager is responsible for, um, first of all, measuring the actors as they come in and getting any measurements possible from the, before the actor is called in through the agent or through the actor themselves. Actually then checking those physical measurements and arranging any kind of fittings so that the designer is there and the fittings can take place appropriately. The cutter draper or first hand, the cutter draper is the one that takes the drawing of the costume designer, discusses with the designer how that costume could be built, has an expertise in building costumes, and so that a designer and a first hand can, or the cutter draper can discuss how that costume should be built. A cutter, Sometimes this is one person, sometimes it's two, but a cutter generally cuts the flat pattern working with the, if you know what a commercial paper pattern looks like, that would be a cutter creating a flat pattern like that on a table. A draper would create the pattern on a mannequin working in the three-dimensional form. And the design sort of dictates which is the, the better method for coming to the end of that design. Um, sometimes flat pattern works, sometimes draper, and often it's a combination of the two. And then that is interpreted into a actual cut piece of fabric by the first hand. The first hand marks each piece and is, pins it together so that then the, that garment is pinned together for the stitcher. The stitcher sits at the sewing machine and then runs the fabric through the sewing machine so that it is ready for a first fitting. The first fitting is where you check and make sure that each of these garments fit the way that it should be and there can be major adjustments made at that time. Then it goes back into the workroom and is up, finished up to the point of second fitting where the, that's when you call the actor in and you determine a hemline. So I like to work with one fitting so that you don't waste a bunch of people's time. In a fitting, you generally have the designer, the costume shop manager, and the cutter draper, so that the cutter draper can pin and repin according to the designer's um, requirements. The costume shop manager is making sure that the priorities are manageable for the shop with the amount of work that has to happen. And then there's a note taker along with the actor. So it's quite a big, a big group of people that you're getting together and that you wanna make sure that you're not wasting anybody's time. So I like to work with one fitting and try and get as many questions answered unless we're absolutely building something for a difficult body and sometimes that takes more than one. But generally I know more than two. The finisher would be some person that is going to do all the handwork on the garment. So at the end of the machine, the stitcher is working by machine, the finisher is the hand working. So that could be hems, that could be um, securing closures such as buttons or hooks and eyes or snaps so that the garment will uh, go on to the actor and accommodate whatever kind of quick changes are necessary, whether that's a, uh, an enclosed hidden zipper underneath a line of buttons to pretend that it is a 19th century garment or any other kind of way to get somebody in and out of a garment by um, necessity. And I have posted some 
I posted one uh, YouTube of a quick change so you can take a look at how that looks. And we, uh, we've done a quick change that was 10 seconds. They had to go off stage literally and then go back on stage. And that was in a Romeo and Juliet scene when she comes off of the balcony scene from the with the nightgown and she has to go back into her dress. So, you know, you, you have to very carefully um, in that kind of thing, you have to discuss that in the construction of the garment. And then you have to discuss that with the dressers and do rehearsals. So these teams of the run crew and the construction crew have to work very, very, very carefully together. Back to the um, costume fabrication. So embellishment can be anything that's put on top of the costume to finish it, whether it's a painted element, a beading, embroidery, to then sometimes dictate and help define the time period. It can be dyeing, aging, distressing, uh, any of those things to make the garment look as though the character has had it for the entire life that the character has needed it. And then again, same with costume procurement, which is sometimes you are able to borrow, rent, and buy costumes. So even if we're doing a contemporary piece, we often require that clothes are built because of either the requirement of the play or the um, time frame that it has to happen in, or possibly because of the actor's body, it's better that we build something than we try and buy it. And each of you know you have, you have been responsible for costume procurement of your own wardrobe. And it's just not as easy as it seems. You may need to try on you know, five pairs of jeans to get one pair of jean that fits. So sometimes we end up making a pair of jeans for someone instead of buying a pair and going through the process of uh, getting them from five or six different sources or five or six different brands, trying them on and then thinking, are we gonna alter those or ours, is it just better to make them? When we go into the um, production then, the costume crew head or the supervisor is the one that determines the um, schedule, the number of dressers that are required, how much rehearsal is going to need to accommodate the quick changes. And generally we meet with the crew, which would be the dressers. We meet with the crew first to discuss the entire project. The designer comes and presents, this is what the work is like. The costume crew had then arranges for quick change rehearsals so that the actor comes in with the dresser that they're working with. They work in the dressing room first to do the costume on and off, and then actually go out to stage where the quick change booth will be and then they do from the exit of the actor into the booth, change, and then go back on stage to make sure that the timing is completely accurate. And this happens before first dress rehearsal. So that when you get to the dress rehearsal, there's already some element of familiar and known to go between costume to costume if you don't have time to go back to the dressing room. In addition to dressing, we also have maintenance for costumes. This is something that we don't share with scenery at all in that um, according to Actors' Equity, all the skin parts or those garments that are closest to the body must be washed every day for every performance and be clean. So all of the undergarments, such as hose, stockings, shoe, uh, socks, um, bras, slips, underwear, t-shirts are washed daily. And out, outer garments are dry cleaned once a week. And then in addition to that, any sorts of things, there's natural wear and tear that happens. You can imagine with a quick change, some things just uh, may end up with a slight tear, or if the finished carpenter wasn't that careful, you're gonna to have to be dealing with certain things. And that's, the dress rehearsals are the time when you really discover that. And it is very, uh, very careful dance between each department to get that to work together. And then in the lighting department, the lighting designer, as we talked last time, determines the plot, shows the grid where the instruments are hanging from above. The master electrician is the one that is responsible for um, making sure that all of the instruments are, are well maintained, that they're hung in the appropriate place. The electrician assists with the, and there's many assistants that hang in focus because you could have 175 instruments. So that's way more than one person can do. 
but the electrician is responsible for making sure that that particular lighting instrument as determined on the plot has both the gel color that is required, that that instrument is plugged into this circuit so that when it goes to the lighting board, that will be able to be responsible and respond in the way that the designer has intended so that certain lights are ganged together so that when the lighting cue is called, lights that are lighting a specific area or a special for a particular scene are able to be illuminated really with the push of a button. So in the production run crew for there, you have operating people who operate the fly system. Many times this is also computer operated. So you have somebody that is backstage and the fly system would be anything that goes up and down in the scenery which could be a curtain, it could be a backdrop, it could, they could fly in an entire set. So for example, early on in the semester when we looked at how to succeed in business, all of the sinks came flying in from above. That was by a push of a button from somebody operating the fly system. And then the board operator, who's the person that's actually executing the queue as called, all of the queues, remember, are called by the stage manager. And then the board operator is initiating the queue by pushing a button so that then that will light the specific thing that the designer has called on for that moment in time. And that I think is the last slide. Yes. So let's go to our screen and we're almost to time. Sorry, that was very, very fast. And I just wanted to give you, this will of course be published and I'm gonna now go to the questions. This will be published on the page with the crafts and you'll have to take a look at those YouTubes um, on your own and they're really fun. So I'm gonna move my screen up so I'm not looking down at you guys. Okay, let's talk about some of the questions so that in any other questions that you have that you'd like to put in chat or you can raise your hand, but I'm going to first address what is the process like with the creative team working with the customer for a musical? Okay, so this question is actually, I have a couple of, um, I have a couple questions actually to you about this. Are you referring to a customer who, are, are you referring to the designer working with the team, how, the, how you work as the costume designer to establish the look? Or are you referring to the customer who would be uh, possibly the person executing the costume? Or are you referring to the dresser who's the person that's putting the costume on the actor. Can you be more specific, Lexi, in what you were asking? The designer, okay. Okay, so a de the costume designer works with the director and the scene designer to make sure that the director, hopefully they have a vision. And you know what? Sometimes they don't. And then in my experience it's like whoever has the best idea wins and sometimes it's whoever has the first idea and I I am uh, very reluctant to endorse the first idea because I feel like it should be the best idea is the one that the one that is that is executed and the one that will tell the story the best so those are a series of meetings that happen and they can happen as much as you know they can happen a year in advance two years in advance if it's opera it's happening a long time in advance and then you, that's when we talked last time, uh, look at the lecture from last time when we talk about how the designers work and they'll bring, communicate with sketches, um, photographs, uh, collaged works together and say, is, is this what you're thinking? Is this, because directors are really not trained visually. Generally designers bring visual materials to the director and say, what is your response to this? Is this what you're thinking? Does this give you the emotional hit that you, that you want out of this moment or from this character? So it's the designer's responsibility to then bring something to the table to have a response from the director to say, yes, this is what we want the audience to see. So hopefully that helps um, answer that question briefly. And then you just keep trying things. And once you get set on a sort of a particular look, then even if you have one character, you have a couple of key characters that you can work off, then that can sort of set the tone for all of the other characters. So you work with the, with the main characters first. Who do you see as the lead? 
the protagonist, the antagonist, who are the secondary, and then you sort of arc out from there. And you decide whether you're making a team approach, like you give, uh, again, to uh, not belabor the point, but if you're working with Romeo and Juliet, then you definitely have the team of the, of the Capulets and the Montagues, two separate teams. You can color code them. You can decide any kind of way that you want to help the audience understand who these people are and which side of the fence do they sit on and, and how are they related to the whole. So there's a, there's come and take the design class. There's, there's just a lot of ways to try and figure that out. And then the second question we have is, does the stage manager give notes throughout the run? Yes. The stage manager absolutely gives notes completely throughout the run. The designer and the directors are not there. So if there's a cue that is missed because the dressers were not ready or the actor went off stage and they didn't go to the right place, that is noted in the rehearsal reports and in the performance report. And it then is noted because the, the performance reports go out to everybody. They are sent by email immediately following the performance. And at that point, if there's a number of lines missed, the director can weigh in and say, you need to do a line rehearsal of this scene. Or the designer can say, you know, you need to do a second quick change rehearsal, or maybe we need to rethink how that's happening because it didn't, it's not, this is the second time it's been missed. So that's not gonna work. We need to rethink how this particular moment in time is working. We'll need to go back and re-rehearse. Sometimes you don't always have enough rehearsal beforehand. That's why with Broadway shows, they do um, out of town tryouts or they do previews for two or three weeks or months so that they get the show completely tight before it is actually you know, made for prime time. Now those tickets for previews are less and people know and some people love coming to previews because they know that they're seeing something that's raw, something that's not completely um, formed and consistent. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the, you know, the, the production stage manager is responsible for holding all of the elements and also acknowledges when they perhaps called a cue late, when they skipped over a cue, uh, or when they have to know the show so well that when we get up, when we get into a certain scene and there's and the lighting cue isn't quite right, they have to can quickly look through their script and see why that lighting cue isn't isn't presenting in the way that the designer um, had wanted. So the production stage manager has an incredible amount of responsibility and an incredible amount of power and demands a huge place of respect in the running of a show. Any other questions? Well, thank you for those. I, I really appreciate it. Um, we are at time at 11. So what I'm gonna do is I will get the I will get these Zooms, these recordings posted on our page, and then you'll be able to have all of these different YouTube, um, uh, YouTube little films so that you can look at and it will more illuminate each of these backstage roles and how these craftspeople are so instrumental in creating these incredible lush and beautiful visuals for onstage performances, okay? All right, I will see you guys on Monday. Have a good weekend. And remember the final will be released on Saturday. And also let's try and set up some times for you to meet with your groups. And if you need me to do that, I'm totally available. Just send me an email and we'll set stuff up. Okay, okay thank you so much. All right, Mari, glad, glad you're back and sorry about your DMV situation and hopefully you can get that. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting that, but I will try again eventually. <laughs> yeah, I actually heard, you know, I heard from a friend yesterday that um, I'm not sure if you could get there, but Santa Paula has much more availability. It's, it's less than an hour away, but they're not overrun. Like somehow you can hardly get an appointment to lead to DMV or to the Santa Barbara DMV. Yeah, like the problem is that the DMV machines, uh, they cannot read the board, so. Yeah, difficult. Never try, they say like, oh, your passport's not being recognized. And I'm like, um, <laughs> this is the only document I have that is like, that has some value here. So 
I have to go to other DMVs to see if their machines work and recognize my passport. So I will have to try again. <laughs> or possibly in Los Angeles. Yeah, like I will I will try the Golira DMV and if it doesn't work, I will have to go to LA. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry it's so complicated. So Yeah, but don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or anything you wanna talk about before we go? Lexi, thank you for your questions. I really appreciate it. Um, and for sure, thank you for answering them. Yeah, uh, any um, all of our classes will be online in the fall, so I'm going to be teaching costume technology completely online. I'll be checking out sewing machines to people that don't have them. So uh, I have some for uh, you know take home use because we will be working with. Uh, learning both hand sewing and machine sewing. I'll be doing dyeing demonstrations. I'll do, uh, we'll make a, have a jewelry project out of found objects. Um, there's any number of different kinds of things that we do in costume technology, including this, this methodology of getting something from the page of the designer to stage. How does that process work? So that's something that we spend some time on. So if you're around, no matter where you are now, you can take it. I will, um, I'm available, please email me anytime. I'm generally trying to check quite frequently to um, see how you all are doing. I'll see you on Monday for sure. Bye now. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you.